Uh, for those of you that don't know me, um, my name is James, and I'm a regular member here at the 1115 service with my family. Um, but it's really nice to be here with you now. Um, before we continue, do please keep your Bibles open, um, but we're, we'll pray before we start. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, as we come now to the privilege of reading and getting to know your word, please grant us understanding. Please work in us by your Spirit to change our hearts and minds, that we may bring you glory and honour in our lives. Amen. They didn't know they were free. They didn't know they were free. Their president had won them their freedom, but they didn't know they were free. Their president was Abraham Lincoln, and their freedom came from the Emancipation Proclamation. That was an act that granted freedom to all slaves in Confederate States of America. And it was announced on New Year's Day in 1863. 1863. However, that wonderful news of freedom didn't reach some of the more southerly states of America for a long time. In fact, the news of freedom didn't reach Galveston in Texas until June 19th, today's date, in 1865, more than two years later. So during that time, those slaves, they didn't know they were free. And the president had done all that was needed to win them their freedom but they didn't know they were free. And so those two years were much the same as any other, as they neither knew, felt, or exercised the freedom that they would have hardly dared to dream of. They were unaware that they had the right to live out their freedom. They continued in their slavery. And so my prayer is that these verses from Romans that God has for us this evening will help us not to be unaware of the wonderful freedom that Christ has won for us. And it will in fact show us and remind us of the freedom we have in Christ so that, so that we may choose to exercise that freedom and freely offer ourselves to serve the living God. So let's look together to see exactly what we are freed from and then also what we are freed for. So what is it we are freed from? Well, firstly, we are freed from the penalty of sin. Oh, I think I might just be turning this off. There we go. Freed from the penalty of sin. And what is the penalty of sin? The penalty of sin is death. Sin leads to death. Look with me at verse 23. Quite simply, the wages of sin is death. And again, at the end of verse 21, we are going to be jumping around a bit today, um, but verse 21, talking of sin, Paul says, those things result in death. Death is the proper and just punishment by God for a life of sin. A life that ignores the living God who made us and puts ourself in his place. And so the wages, the only payment that we deserve for our sin, is death. And that death is more than just a physical death, but it's also the eternal separation from God. Sin leads to death. And so it comes as wonderful news when we see that for those who trust in Christ for those who repent of a life of sin, that we are freed, freed from the penalty of death because Christ has paid the price. When he died on the cross, the wages of sin, that is death, were paid for us. And what's more, we are given something else in its place. We are given quite the opposite. We are given eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life. Look with me again at verse 23. The wages of sin is death, yes, but the gift, the gift of God, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of Christ's work on the cross, God offers, offers us a gift of a new and better life, eternal life with him. And that is grace, generously giving us a gift that we never deserved. Let's say there's a man in prison, He's in his cell and he's on death row. He is awaiting the ultimate penalty of death for his sin. And he can't free himself. Even if from now on he commits himself to a lifetime of good deeds, he still remains under the sentence of death for his sins. One day the cell door opens and the warden of the prison is standing at his door. 
He's holding a very padded out envelope. And the warden stands at the door and starts to open the envelope. He starts to take out some papers. The first paper is a document for the prisoner's immediate release, freedom from the penalty of death. And the other papers are a detail of a full bank account and a one-way ticket to a sunny island somewhere, a new and better life. And he folds them back into the envelope, puts them in his hand, and he reaches out his arm. And so the prisoner takes it. He takes it. Of course he does. It's a gift. And likewise, the only thing that we can do and should do is to accept God's gift to us, to accept God's amazing grace. But it's also important that we do not just begin the Christian life as those who accept God's grace, but then live out our lives as those under the law, still trying to gain God's favour or to add a little something of our own to Christ's already complete work on the cross. Now, what do I mean by law? Well, previously in this letter, Paul has been building an argument to show that the law, that is, in essence, the Ten Commandments, doing the right thing, will never save us. We cannot live up to God's high standards. Like the prisoner, even a commitment to a lifetime of good deeds would still never free him from the penalty of sin. And without faith in Christ, any of us are essentially on death row. Equally, we can't rely on things like regular church attendance or rely on reading our Bible all the time or rely on generally just trying our best. They're good things, but they will mean absolutely nothing when it comes to us being right with God. And we can only throw ourselves upon the mercy and the wonderful grace of God through Christ our Lord, who has freed us from the penalty of sin. Now, Paul is very good, especially in these few chapters, of preempting the questions of his readers. And the question in this passage that Paul preempts is since as Christians we are under grace and not under the law, what's to stop us from sinning? Why not? Look with me at verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? As Christians, we are free from the ultimate penalty of death for our sin, so why not just carry on regardless? Let our hair down and fill our boots with sinfulness. Surely now we can get away with it. Well, end of verse 15, what does Paul say? By no means. No way. And I think this is where Paul really goes to town in correcting our thinking about this. Paul is saying that because we are free from the penalty of sin, because the wages of death have been paid for us, then sin is no longer our master. The wages of our old master have been paid by Christ. He is now our master. So in Christ, we have been freed from the slavery of sin freed from the slavery of sin. I suppose that many of us know and feel that sin is an ever-present reality in our lives. And Paul shows us that for anyone that does not live with Christ as their Lord, they are a slave, a slave to sin. Look with me at verse 16. <clears throat> Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? So, if you are someone who is offering yourself to sin, if you are giving yourself over to it, serving and obeying sin, then it's certainly not what the world will tell you, but Paul says you are a slave to sin. And notice there is no middle ground. Again, no middle ground. Verse 16, you are slaves to the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, as we saw, or to obedience which leads to righteousness. So you are either one or the other, a slave to sin or a slave to God. But, notice that Paul is not saying you really must try hard to free yourself from sin or try harder to obey God. Now what Paul is pointing to is a complete status change for the Christian. See verse 17 and 18. But thanks be to God, that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you entrusted. In other words, 
If you are a Christian, then yes, you used to be a slave to sin, but now, verse 18, you have been, you have been set free from sin. It's already a done deal. And we can see that Paul's chief concern is that we really know that truth and also that we live as those who really know that truth. There's a Johnny Cash song that I enjoy called Nobody, and one of the verses goes like this. I won't try and do the, the, uh, the voice. Uh, it goes, One time when things were looking bright, I started to whittle it on a stick one night, who said, Hey, that's dynamite. Nobody. Nobody. Nobody warned him he was playing with dynamite. But that's not God's word. Paul is not remaining silent. In his concern that we exercise the freedom that has been won for us, he shows us some of the real dangers. He is saying that if we take a flippant attitude to sin, then we are effectively playing with dynamite. The stuff can mess you up. Look at verse 21. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? In this life, sin, past or present, will only bring you shame. Of course, for the Christian, all and every sin has ultimately been dealt with on the cross. It has been forgiven. But its effects on us in the present is certainly nothing to be desired. See also verse 19. You used to offer the parts of your body to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness. The nature of sin is that it is ever-increasing. What would once shock us and lead us straight to our knees in repentance can all too easily become a daily part of our lives but Paul is saying that's the old way of life let's not take a step backwards sin can mess us up so we must take the warning we must see the danger of sin and remember that we do not have to obey sin because we are free from sin as one preacher put it as sin is no longer our master we are free to disobey sin free to not sin and why? Because Christ's work is actually so amazing that he really has won us the freedom from sin. The wages of sin have been paid. The chains of our old master have been loosed and the shackles that have kept us in slavery have been broken. So why would we want to go back? Why, why even get close? You may have um, seen or heard of the film 12 Years a Slave. I think it was on TV a few weeks ago. And the film is based on the real accounts of a man called Solomon Northup. He was sold into slavery in pre-Civil War America. And he experienced slave, slavery in a number of different situations. Experiencing chains and shackles and humiliation and witnessing death all around him. He was eventually freed from his life of slavery with friends from help from friends and family. Now could you ever imagine that having been freed from slavery... Solomon would ever book a weekend away from the family so he could find where he used to stay in his old master's house and slip back on the chains and fasten up the shekels once again and sit down effectively back in slavery. Of course, we couldn't because it's ridiculous. That place would have running right through it the stench of death. The stench of death. <clears throat> he had seen death but like us, he had been freed from death. He had been a slave, but like us, he had been freed from slavery. So why would he want to go anywhere near it again? He was free, and he did not have to obey the call of that master anymore. So when we are faced with the temptation to step a foot back into sin, when we hear the call of our own old master, and we will, it will be very good to view our sin as it really is covered in the stench of death because that's where it wants to take us but we are free from sin it is not our master now you may be thinking hold on a minute wait freedom from sin freedom from sin how can that be because i don't feel it and maybe when I was talking about the dangers of sin, you were thinking, I know, I know only too well. I wish I could escape it. I wish I could hate it. I know it's a slavery, but how can I break free? Well, let me start by saying that 
If that is you, then I or any of the staff team here tonight will be very happy to speak to you afterwards. Please don't feel you have to suffer alone. But also, please be encouraged. Please take heart. If you are feeling truly bothered by your sin, then that is actually a good thing. The Spirit of Christ is working in you. And see that Paul is not saying, hey, do you remember when we used to sin? Thank goodness we don't do that anymore. Of course he's not. No, Paul has never promised us perfection. Remember, Paul knows our sinful hearts, and that's why he's writing these verses. He was preempting it. And he knows that even as Christians, under grace, we still search for ways to excuse ourselves so that we may continue sinning. He knows his readers, but he is saying that the slavery of sin that wants, us to, wants to beat us down, that wants us to sin right now, that wants to wreck our lives and draw us away from Christ, it no longer has that power over us. So, for example, when your friends at work or the people you meet start to gossip at somebody else's expense, remember you are free from sin. You really do now have the freedom to deny sin, to change or to end that conversation. You are free from that stuff. Or when you find yourself on the internet late at night and everyone else in the house has gone to bed, then remember, you really do have the freedom to say no to temptation. I recently heard from a secular YouTube channel that our brains are not hardwired to resist the temptations that we face from internet marketing or pornography just to click away. And in some way, I guess they're right. But in Christ, in Christ, we are free to resist. Because now, Christ is our master. We serve Christ. And that is what Paul is going to show us is the ultimate goal of our freedom. We have seen what we have been freed from, that is the penalty and the slavery of sin. But what are we freed for? Well, we are freed to offer ourselves to God. To offer ourselves to God. <clears throat> now, if the last two points have been a bit more stick than carrot, don't worry, because there is plenty of carrot to be found in these verses. Paul presents us with a far better alternative than slavery to sin and challenges us to freely offer ourselves to a better master. Look with me at verse 19, just a little way down. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. Paul is saying that we not only should exercise ongoing disobedience to sin in remembering we are free from sin, but also ongoing obedience, submission to God in offering ourselves to him. Not only because we should, we know we should, but also because we can. We are free to do so. Now, in verse 19, when Paul says, I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves, He's basically saying that the picture of being a slave to God only goes so far because slavery to God is open and free and God is the most gracious and wonderful of masters. Because look at the results of offering ourselves to him. Instead of the life of slavery to sin that takes us away from righteousness and leads us through shame to death, offering ourselves to God leads us away from sin to a life of holiness and leads to eternal life. See at the end of verse 19, offer yourselves in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. And again in verse 22, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. God has a far greater and higher purpose for you that goes beyond just lifting you out of the grip of slavery. As we have seen, the gift of grace has been given to us to free us from death and the slavery of sin. But those things, and through those things, God's ultimate and higher purpose is to make you more and more like his son, starting here on this earth. By his spirit, God is changing our hearts so that we may love and serve him now and in eternity. In my job as a music teacher, I have a weekly slot <clears throat> leading a primary school orchestra. 
doesn't look quite like that. And just a few weeks ago, I was looking out at everyone, and there were instruments they were holding, the cellos, the violins, and the clarinets, and everything, and I thought, the potential here looks amazing. This looks like it could go really very well. Now, it doesn't take us much beyond one, two, three, to realize they're not quite following the intended plan that I've laid out for them. Now, do I exhort them to play the right notes in the right order? Yes, I do. Do I forgive them when they get it wrong? Maybe not as much as I should, but yes, I do. But I do those things because I know that we are intended for a higher purpose, to make beautiful music together. And in the same way, we can freely choose, as Paul says above at the end of verse 13, to offer ourselves as instruments of righteousness. Or as our passage would have it, as slaves to righteousness, willing slaves to God, choosing to live out the higher purpose that God has for our lives in offering ourselves in service to him. So when it goes on in verse 19 to say, offer the parts of your body in slavery to righteousness, that is to God, then let us offer the works of our hands. Let us offer the desires of our eyes and our hearts. Let's offer every part of our being over to God in submission to that beautiful process that makes us more and more like Jesus. Let's offer ourselves to that master. Basically, we get freedom mixed up the wrong way round. The world will say that we are free to live as we wish, to please ourselves. But the reality is, that is a life in slavery to sin. As Christians, we may think that because of God's grace, we are off the hook and free to sin. But that is wrought with real danger and is choosing not to exercise the freedom that has been won for us in Christ. The way in which we are really free and the best kind is that we are free to offer our lives in love and service to the living God who made us. So how are these truths going to make a difference to us this week, tomorrow, tonight? Well, we need to remember that we are free from sin and offer ourselves to God. So as we talk with people later on in our conversations, remember you are free from sin. Offer the content of your conversation to God. When driving tomorrow in the Monday morning traffic and someone cuts you up and the red mist comes down, well, remember you are free from sin. Instead, offer yourself right there to God. When you continue in your decision to write someone off because they've upset you in the past, remember that is the old you. You are free from sin. So offer yourself to God. When friends want you to smoke what you know you shouldn't or drink more than you know you should, remember you are free to obey God. When you're in the heat of an argument and you're determined not to give in until you have the upper hand, you know you are free from sin. So now you can offer yourselves daily your life to the glory and honour of God because that is freedom. Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for all that you have accomplished for us on the cross. We pray that by your spirit, you will help us to remember that we are free from sin. And that truth will make a difference to the way we live our lives. Please help us to have a willing spirit to offer our lives daily in love and service to you. Amen. great work has been done for us. Let's offer ourselves in song as we sing our final song tonight, offering our lives, our hands, our voices, and our wills. Let's stand and offer together. <clears throat>